So hey guys, um, my name is Kevin Chen, and today I'll be uh, presenting you about what, like, what is DAX and whether DAX will become may become the new blockchain. So first, as an introduction to myself, I'm an evangelist at the IOTA Foundation. So some of the uh, work I've been doing is including uh, doing business development, adoption strategy, and as well as uh, ecosystem uh, development. In addition to being a uh, being an evangelist at the IOTA Foundation, I also uh, spearheaded and uh, co-run the uh, IOTA Evangelist Network, which is where a group of uh, where a group of global group of IOTA like enthusiasts and professionals who are also uh, looking to spread the awareness of and adoptions and potential collaboration with IOTA technology, the protocol, as well as to their local respective communities. Cool. So. What I'll be presenting here is not exactly about IOTA, but more about the larger, um, this new field of DAX, which I will actually uh, get into. So, um, so right now, when you think about, uh, so right now, um, when you think about blockchain, people think blockchain is the uh, de facto uh, distributed ledger technology. But blockchain, and then people have been using blockchain and DLT, uh, like just interchangeably. But right now, there's actually a new type of distributed ledger technology, but that's not a uh, blockchain. Instead, they're called DAGs. And here, in this presentation, I'll describe the differences between the blockchain and a DAG. So first, I'll talk, first, um, I'll talk a little bit about, like give you guys like a recap about what blockchain is, and then I'll dive into more about DAGs, for example, what is DAX, and then a little bit of a history of DAX in the cryptocurrency space, and then the uh, DAX in, that are used today. And then finally, about what are the, some of the, some of the uh, fundamental differences and uh, which type of architecture will be right for you guys. So first, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, blockchain recap. So are, how, are you guys familiar, like at least understand like uh, conceptually like how blockchain works? Okay, cool. So with that said, I'll, I'll go through this really, really quick. So blockchain is a linked list. So a linked list is that you have like an object and, it ha and an, an object has like an address, but with, inside the object, it also has a, uh, it also holds the address of, of a previous object. And in this case, we have the uh, blocks here. And then, the, and, the, and then the latest block would, would hold the, uh, the hash, which is the address of the previous block right here, thus forming a linked list. And for example, you see in uh, blockchain info, which is the uh, Bitcoin website, uh, when I look at the uh, block height, which is the block number, it shows you what the hash, like the block hash of it is, and what the previous block hash of it is as well. Thus, making this as a uh, this uh, block pointing to a previous block. So, blockchain, like for example, uh, Bitcoin, not only has a chain, but it also has a, a protocol as well, which is a set of instruction, which is open source, that explains about exactly how how these uh, blocks are created, like who creates the blocks, what transactions are put into blocks. All of these are these protocol constructions to make this chain happen. In order to create the chains, you also need the uh, miners. And in this space, the miners are the uh, validators who are the ones who look at the, uh, like the uh, validated transactions or the, tra the transactions that, are, that, that have the uh, proper uh, signatures and also they are not, uh, make sure they're not double spin and then they put them into the uh, blocks and then and then the miners would then need to ha do some uh, cryptographic puzzle to d determine which of these miners have the, uh, have the block to be put into the uh, next uh, Bitcoin blockchain. And remember, Bitcoin blockchain is like a singleton. And then there's a lot of miners that constitutes the uh, global network. And they're all doing these cryptographic puzzles to compete with each other to figure out which, whether their block will be the one that will be put onto the uh, blockchain. And, and then this is one of the uh, fundamental features of not just Bitcoin blockchain, but distributed ledger technology in general, that 
it has distributed trust where all these uh, ledgers are valid, are uh, validated, verified, and and um, once updated into chain, they all they all have the uh, same blockchain, and that makes it uh, trustless, which is a huge contrast to what we see in uh, Venmo or PayPal and so forth. However, there's a huge problem with this to have this uh, distributed uh, trust, this uh, entire distributed ledger, which that in order for the uh, different nodes, the for example, the miners to communicate each other, to for example, like determine like which is the right block to put into blockchain, they have to have the uh, right underlying physical network as well. And if there's a lot of uh, propagation issues, then you, they will cause a lot of issues, including uh, like a lot of poor bandwidth. And then some of the uh, miners with very bad networks will not be able to be able to participate in the consensus and they'll end up just getting left behind because they're not able to update the newest block in time. Thus, uh, a, a solution would be that there will be a fixed block interval, meaning that, for example, in Bitcoin, there will be a 10, mar 10 minutes uh, block interval such that there will be a lot of um, miners with maybe like n not as strong uh, like ne like network bandwidth to still be able to give them some time to participate in the consensus. And in order for them to have the fixed uh, block interval, uh, Bitcoin would have to like change the uh, proof of work complexity. Like for example, like the, uh, cr the complexity of making the uh, cryptographic puzzles. If there's more miners pr participating in this network, then they will have like more hash rates and hence that they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll usually be faster to get a consensus of a block. But with, when they make the cryptographic puzzles, they were able to um, make the uh, blocks, the, make, the, uh, like the, make the miners like, do a little bit more work, even though there's more miners around. Hence, they're able to use that to control the uh, block creation time. But another issue comes along, is, which is the uh, scalability where if you have like a fixed amount of a uh, block interval and then also a fixed amount of a uh, block size, that means you have a fixed amount of like transactions per second or transactions per minute. And that, would be, that may be a uh, huge issues if uh, Bitcoins want to scale because um, right now with the, this uh, fixed uh, transactions per second and then there's more people want to make transactions on it, then they'll have to pay like a higher amount of fees because the miners, they could be more choosy about which transactions that they want to to pick, to put into their respective blocks. And then, they, of course, they want to pick the uh, blocks that has the higher fees. Hence, the, uh, the physical network really does matter. Now, I'll talk about DAG. And then first, I'll discuss what is, what is a DAG. So for those who don't know, DAG is a directed acyclic graph. So directed means that it's, it has a direction from a node A to node B. A cyclic means that it's not a circle, so it does not go like loop around. Instead, you can think of it as like a stream. It goes to, to some direction. And then a graph is just an entire network where you have like, a, like key wise pairs where you have a one, like a node, where like a vertices like they point, that points to another that has some kind of a relationship. And if you have multiple of those, then, then you'll form, a, then you'll form a, some kind of a graph. And then here, this, this is the edge, and then it, can, it tells you like what the magnitude is. For example, like a node could be like a city, and then the edge could be like the distance between the cities. And here we can say that this is 10 miles. And then you can use like this like lo geolocation, and then you can make it as a, some kind of graph. So, what's the difference between trees and DAGs, if, if you guys know? Anyone? Yeah. So, another question is, are trees DAGs? So the answer is yes. So trees are actually DAGs as well. But not, so, so all trees are DAGs, but not all 
DAGs or trees. For example, trees will only have a, so like if you're like a node, you will only have like one parent, that's a tree. But with a DAG, you can have multiple parents. Like for example, like D has multiple parents. And then same with a C as well. So um, before, before going further, I think um, once I get more about like DAGs using uh, like, like with, in regarding like distributed ledger technology, I think the, uh, like the child and then the parents kind of get, get flipped around. Since here, I'm talking about parents and it points to the child. But when I'm talking about distributed ledger technology, it's actually the child, which is the most recent transaction, will be pointing to the parents, which are the prior transactions. So just to let you guys know. So pop quiz for you guys. Is this a DAG? Make sure that you guys are paying attention. Yeah, it's a DAG. It has one direction. And then goes to F right here. And it's not, it's not a circle. Is this a DAG? Where's, where's the circle? This, right? This is actually not a circle right here. It points to nine, points to 10. So it's a DAG, right? Yeah, it's a DAG. Is this a DAG? Why not? Where's the circle here? Are you guys able to see this? Yeah, that's right. Here's a circle, so it's cy cyclical. So you're right, this is not a DAG right here. So what's the difference between DAG and a linked list? Yeah, but like, like, like uh, ignoring blockchain for a second, like just fundamentally, what's the difference between DAG and a linked list? So yeah, uh, linked list is linear. So you only have one parent, and then the parent can only have one child. But for a DAG, you can have multiple parents and then multiple childs. So are you guys are you guys okay so far? You guys are good. Okay. So now let's up the difficulty a level a little bit, and then here we'll discuss about how DAG is being used in a uh, cryptocurrency. So the first uh, proposal to put some kind of a, like add some kind of like a DAG structure is the uh, ghost proposal on the Bitcoin. And this is written by uh, Aviv and Jonathan, both uh, brilliant mathematicians from uh, Israel, mathematician academics. So ghost means the greediest, heaviest observed subtree. And the goals here are, is that um, they, they're aware that um, the Bitcoins has all these uh, scalability issues. So their goal f with creating this protocol which is actually like a protocol, like I think it's on top of Bitcoin, or like a uh, like a like a maybe even like a hard fork of uh, Bitcoin because of the protocol change. Is that they want to uh, make like block transaction, like blo block creation from like one block for ten minutes to one block per second, and then they want to increase thus they want to increase two hundred transactions per second, which I think is about like three point five a second transactions per second, like right now. Yeah, uh, although like maybe as high as seven transactions per second. And then, um, so thus, with this protocol, code, they want to introduce a subtree, like a method, which is a, which is a DAG, and then onto the uh, Bitcoin itself. So how does it work? So here, this is what Bitcoin has. So you have this main chain, which is the main blockchain, which is the, all the, which is all the black squares. You have the Guinnesses at the beginning, but then here, you have these forks, and then what happens here is that, let's say this is a, this is a blockchain number two, and then we're figuring out what to do with, a block, with the block number three, and then, and then at this time, it's, it so happens that um, there's actually two miners created this uh, block number three about the same time, and they're both uh, latched onto this blockchain, and then there might be some miners that accepted this chain here, and another miner accepted this chain as well. And then, and then let's say, for example, um, what happens is like, which, which, which uh, chain would you choose? You'll choose the one 
that will end up becoming longer, and then it will become longer than the other chain. And that way, um, the, all the other miners will want to be at the chain that is, on, that is the longest chain. Because if they're, on, they're mining like a shorter chain, then they know that they're going to be left behind. They're just wasting their time. So once they find out like one of this fork is like becoming longer, then all these miners from here would adopt to this chain. And then this will become an orphan block, meaning that it's just becoming stale, which is another name. And then um, Ethereum also calls it like uncle as well. Like for example, if you're this block and then they consider this stale block as, as an orphan. So what happens here is that once you um, have all of these main chain, then this block here is stale. And that means, unfortunately, all this work that's been done here is just, just nothing. It's just been a waste. So however, in Bitcoin with the ghost protocol, what they do is that, um, it's that let's say that you're on block number two and you're trying to figure out which is the uh, longest block, which is, which is the uh, main chain. Instead of looking for the one with the longest, like the greatest length, they actually look at the one with the uh, biggest tree. And the biggest tree include even like the stale or orphan blocks as well. So in a Bitcoin, they will look at this one, which has the, let's say that um, this also has like another block right here. And then this has a depth of five. So they'll look at this, this depth. But then in a Bitcoin plus ghost, they'll actually consider this one instead because this has more work that's done, even though like all the work turned out to be a stale block. So here, their main chain will be the one that has, that they'll see the one that has the most work. And then they'll actually pick, go through this chain rather than this one right here, even though this has the uh, longer, longer, uh, like the treat, like the longer depth. So what are some of the, uh, what are some of the benefits compared to uh, Bitcoin? So some of the be benefits includes that they actually have higher transaction rates because since they are not, since using a Bitcoin ghost, they, they, they allow like having like stale blocks and then the stale, and then the, uh, stale blocks c will also be included into figuring out which, which is a long chain. They're willing to um, have more blocks to be created, thus that they require like less proof of work. And then even though it has no forks, but here it has, it has more forks, but it has no problem because all the forks will be calculated within, once again, what would the uh, main chain be? And thus, even the uh, stale blocks, even though they're not part of the main chain, would still uh, be considered as what would the main chain be. So there's not as many work that's being wasted. However, with the Bitcoin ghost, there's a more added complexity where that um, a lot of the uh, transmissions are like just a lot of miners transmission which are like the orphan blocks rather than which is just the main chain. And then there's also uh, more like, like incentives for like the like miners to be like selfish and then try to like withhold announcements so they have the uh, best, amount, best time to like put their um, like the blocks to, to the right uh, tree and so forth. And overall, this is like, this is actually make, increased the, like the uh, complexity, inc including that um, when, when the uh, chain goes farther and farther along, there's more and more and more, more forks. And then whenever you have like, uh, let's say like block like a few hundred thousand, then you have to consider all these like other forks of the tree as well. So it, re it just really adds up to the complexity. And that's why um, Bitcoin Ghost actually has not been, uh, been, been used in, in, in today's Bitcoin. However, a simplified version of the ghost is used on the Ethereum, where they, they saw that, um, like in the Bitcoin ghost, that, they, that um, you can like, cre like calculate these subtrees or DAX, like since the beginning, but there's like, oh, we'll just have like a, we'll just create some kind of like a, like a cap here, such that um, when we want to calculate what's the main chain, we will look at the uncles or like the stale blocks no more than seven like generations before. And then, so this is something that's actually in the uh, Ethereum white paper. And then there's another project here that's called uh, uh, by uh, these three uh, academics. And then what they're trying to do is that 
they want to have like some kind of a more of a uh, cooperative validation of these uh, of these uh, transactions. And uh, for example, that with some, through some like uh, through some through some algorithms, they, there's like some miners would be able to like delegate delegate more like trusted um, like other mi either other miners or like validators. So their like decision. So these uh, validators would have more decisions on which of these uh, transactions or double spends carry more weight. And so then like the the ones that are more reputable, the validators, like if there's like a if there is like a double spend, for example, then the uh, ones then the uh, validators that with more weight will pick and choose which of the uh, double spend transactions is actually valid and so forth. And then here, um, I'll actually discuss more about these examples uh, in some of these uh, DAC projects. So here are some of the uh, DACs today. So it includes IOTA, but it also includes uh, Spectre, Byteball, and Radix. So I'm, I'll be talking about those four, but there's definitely a lot more. And because of the uh, lack of lack of time, I'll just have to like I have to, I have to go really really like, high level about like what what like some of their like descriptions. Although like if you're more like interested, then I definitely recommend reading their white paper and then Bitcoin talk as well. So first, I'll discuss about like one of the uh, problems about DAGs or like one of the big questions that if you want to create a DAG distributed ledger technology. That, that's something that you have to like resolve. And that is if we have a, like how do you prevent a, a child transaction from just keep pointing to the same parent transaction over and over and over again? So like for example, if you have like a Guinness, like a Guinness block, like the parent, and then if you have like all these child just keep pointing on it, it just kind of like makes, makes it a spear. And then you don't really get this you don't really get this like smooth like stream of DAGs and, and so forth. So um, in the following uh, projects, I'll go over um, how um, some of these uh, projects uh, tackle this question. So first, I'll talk about uh, the IOTA Tango. IOTA Tango is a public uh, distributed ledger technology that is 100% blockless. So, so it has like no blocks, no fees, because it doesn't have any miners. And how uh, IOTA, uh, resolves this uh, question right here is that in the protocol it uses something called like called a uh, like a Mar like a Monte Carlo I mean Markov chain Monte Carlo random walk to p to to tip select which incoming child transaction will point to which pair node so that is done randomly so in the IOTA Tango when a tr child transactions like comes in, which is like a new incoming transactions, it will automatically points to directly to two previous predecessors or parent par uh, parents transactions that are already in the tango. And how it does this is that how they do this tip selections. First, they they, they are randomly pointed to that tip. Then they have to check to make sure that that parent transaction is not a uh, double spend. And then after that, if it is a double spend, then they'll point to another uh, transaction instead. And then finally, they will do some kind of a proof of work, which is uh, which is actually more of a uh, anti-spam proof of work, rather like a anti-cybo attack proof of work, rather than like a consensus algorithm that that what you see in uh, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. So IOTA Tango, since it's very uh, lightweight and has no fees. Its, its biggest use case is that they want to do IoT machine to machine micro tr like transactions, whether it's micro, macro, as well as uh, data security. So the second one here is a uh, bypo, and here they actually has they actually have fees, but and then they they're actually not a proof of work or proof of stake, but they have their own like consensus um, consensus method, which is I'll actually get to next slide. But some this uh, some of uh, Byteball's uh, features are that they are more of a uh, like an applications platform. They are actually already created a lot a lot of like features. For example, uh, conditional payments, which are like which are akin to like non-Turing complete smart con contracts, as well as 
integrated bl bots that helps with the uh, marketplace and that does uh, prediction markets. So there, uh, a lot of their features, they're more orientated towards uh, P2P or like machine to, machine to consumers, for example, this uh, integrated bot. And with their, um, with their like, like consensus methods, they actually have a global uh, transaction finality as well as orphan resistance. So how are they able to accomplish all that? So Byteball, they actually have a uh, kind of a, uh, like a main chain. And then the main chain are, are, main ch main, uh, chain are created by like, transactions made by reputable users, which are called witnesses. And then this goes back to this, this white paper about the, doing this more of this cooperative validation. And this is one of the examples right here. So what happens here is that you have these very well-known reputable users and then they create, make their transactions. And then once they make their transactions, then the uh, protocol will as assume, will presume that their transaction is valid and it's not, not a double spend. Otherwise, if, they, is it, if it is a double spend and then they got caught, then their reputation will go down and they will not become a witness anymore. So with all these witness transactions, uh, these, uh, wit these witnesses then can then list all of the other um, transactions that they deem uh, as valid as well. For example, let's say three or four right here. And then it lists these nodes and then these transactions as, as valid here. And then seven as, as valid right here. So if there is a double spend, then there's then the transaction, then the earliest transaction here would be only the earliest one would be validated. For example, let's say that um, three, five, and six, like this is like a triple spend. There's this one really bad actor. He wants to spend the same amount like three times. So he first spend the uh, one with number three and then try to spend the one for five, five and six. So then, so then the, one, the witness with the number three will catch this first and then catch that, that these are the double spend and only accept the one that, that is the, uh, that has the, the with the uh, earliest witness. So here is a kind of a, uh, like a partial order that's been created that with the witnesses, these are kind of like, they're, they're almost akin to like timestamps that shows the orders, except that they're not actually uh, like timestamps. So one of the, uh, one of the uh, things about BIPO is that it is decentralized, but not fully trustless because you do rely on having these uh, reputable witnesses to make sure to like, to spearhead the uh, consensus in BIPO. So the third exhibit here is Spectra. And Spectra is actually also created by um, Aviv and Jonathan, who created the uh, Ghost protocol earlier. So unlike Ghost, which is kind of like extension of Bitcoin, I think Spectra is actually like its own like pro like its own protocol itself. And Spectra is actually interesting because it's it's kind of like a blockchain and a DAG hybrid. It is a DAG of a DAG of blocks, and then that includes parallel blocks, uh, pl blocks, and then blocks could have more than one predecessor. So um, here, this is um, Aviv and Jonathan also trying to have, try to create another alternate method to make, make the transactions and the block creations even faster to up to 10 blocks per second and seconds of transaction confirmation. So how does this work here is that each pair of, so Let's say that we have this parallel block. What happens if you have a one block, which is X, and another block, which is Y? They have conflicting transactions. Then, in their consensus protocol, they will have to determine which one would win, which one is better than the other. And then, to determine which one is better than the other requires like a vote for all the other previous, uh, previous blocks as well. And um, the one that wins will be the one that has the set of valid transactions, and while the other block would be the set of invalid ones, and will end up being dropped. For example, let's say that here, X and Y, these two contains all exact uh, duplicate transactions. So which ones would, would, would win? So X is gonna vote for itself, 
to say that they, it has all the valid transactions and saying, well, why? So, so this is actually like an arrow sign, like, which is like that. So it's not like greater or less than. And then after that, all these other blocks here will then have to figure out whether to choose X or choose Y. So of course, all of these blocks here, like these are the children of X will point to X. And then all the uh, children of Y will point to Y. So how about all the ones here? They're the ones who will vote for which of the blocks, like which of the blocks that they think that will, will win in the future. And here, they see that, that, um, that x is pointing to three of it, while y is pointing to two. So all these blocks through, through like a recursive call will point to x as a winning block. So x has all of this, and then y has all of this. And then for even, even the, uh, like the future blocks here, like 12, that indirectly points to x and y, they will have to have this entire circle here, and then, and then figure out which, which one which, whether X or Y have the majority, and then they'll pick the one that has the majority. For example, here, I think this has, a, this has eight. That points to X, and then this one here has two. So eight, be, eight speeds two, so uh, 12 will point to X. So here, this could, ha so this happens that, that um, this block here points to three, and then these blocks here decides that this one wins. But the bigger gist is that with this, with this consensus, it's not going to allow um, both of these blocks to be allowed. Either one or the other will have to be dropped. And in this case, they point X is the one that prevails. So the last one is called uh, Radix. And Radix is the one that's, that's, kind of, that's released uh, recently, the white paper, just uh, last September. So here, they have a temper ledger, and it has uh, three components. And then, the comp and then here, it has a network of cluster of nodes. And then it also has a global ledger of like a database that's across all the nodes. And then it has some kind of algorithm that kind of like cryptographically secures the order of events to make sure that the uh, global ledger is, is, in, is in place. So in Radix, uh, temple is like a temple instance, it's like an instance of this uh, of, of this of this global ledger, it's called the universe, and then and then they have a um, bunch of um, modules of like objects that are called atoms. And what's really interesting about atoms is that atoms include like message transactions, and you can even have atoms inside of atoms. So what they're trying to do is like they want to modularize some of the objects here. So. Uh, Radix, they, how they, how they um, horizontally structure themselves is that that the node, which are like the uh, are, are like the users, like for example, like the miners, but they don't they don't have the miners, but they're the users of this uh, ledger, can either create like a set, which is entire uh, temple ledger, or a subset of it, and if they create like a, just a subset of it, it's called a shard, and then if um, an atom is in multiple shards, and then uh, atoms could have could be in multiple shards as a way to as a way to propagate the atoms from one shard to another. So, it's actually uh, pretty uh, similar to uh, like pretty similar to Ethereum sharding, except that ex Ethereum sh let's see, except that Ethereum sharding still has a bunch of uh, Yeah, that's something that I have to like look out, look look, look at more. So um, other uh, there, so the four that I've mentioned about are um, are the ones that are like that are one that, that have been around for a while, and there, here are more upcoming uh, DAX or DAX like protocols, and then some of them that uh, I still need to like look through more about it to give them more better uh, detail. I'll just interject here that I just went to the Dubai blockchain conference last mm -hmm. week and HCash secured a LOI from the Dubai government to help them with a particular set of their blockchain initiatives. So yeah, that's the information edge for you. Well, so are they legit? It seems like they're legit. 
Uh, that part I don't know. <laughs> uh, their, their team was arguably uh, uh, difficult to ask technical questions, so I was just talking to their marketers, but they seemed to have a, 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 some interesting relationship with the Dubai government there. So. That's very interesting. And uh, Swirls is, is the uh, issuer of Hashcraft, which is also yeah, gaining a lot of weird speed at the moment. Hopefully you can dive into that a little, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, uh, I guess maybe, maybe next time. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm still like looking into it as well. I just didn't have, like I was like looking at the other four and then this one I didn't have as much, much time to do like an assessment. Yeah. So as a summary, you have actually have like a spectrum where you have pure blockchain and then you have a pure DAGs that are block list. So IOTA is 100% DAG, which is 100 purely a block list, while we have a Bitcoin and Ethereum. Bitcoin right now is 100% a blockchain and I can say the same thing with Ethereum, excluding the uh, part of the, uh, like the, like they have like a little bit of the ghost broker right there, but still the overall architecture is still a blockchain. And then uh, Spectrum is actually kind of like half and half because they are like a block DAG, so they're a, a DAG of blocks as well. And then Radix and BIPO, BIPO is, it is a DAG, but they have some kind of a, like a uh, central, like they they have like a central like main chain filled with the uh, the uh, like the trusted uh, witnesses. So all in all, there isn't so there isn't like really like a strong like a dichotomy. Like it's either either a blockchain or your DAP. There's a lot of projects that are like using a little bit of both, but it just happens that Bitcoin and IO they're in part of they're in those extremes. And then, so this is like a re recent article, and also talks about that they're also get, also getting caught like having attentions that um, blockchain may not be the only one. And then it also talks about direct and graph as an alternative. So what I'm saying right here is also something that's also been catching up as well. So now, once now that I've gone into uh, blockchains and DAGs. Now I'll talk about like what's the uh, differences between them. Do you guys have, do you have any guys have any questions so far? I have two questions. Um, for white ball, how is signature? I I believe so. Um, I'm not. I think it's like I think it's like it has like some kind of like, com like a complex algorithm, but I do believe that it has some kind of like a reputation that's like an algorithm. Algorithm being, being controlled and so forth, based, based on their like previous histories of like, making transactions. Yeah. One more question: If I order free or transaction free, what's the IOTA token using? So the uh, transaction fee is this free. Yeah. So um, you can use a uh, IOTA token for anything, just like uh, Bitcoin as well. But because it has a uh, free transactions, it makes it much more economical to do like machine to machine transactions. For example, like machines that they want to pay each other all the time. And then like, like single like, transactions all the time. And then if you try to do that on a Bitcoin, for example, then for each of these micro transactions, you have to, still have to pay the same amount of fees. So it makes it uneconomical for you to do uh, micro transactions on a Bitcoin compared to on an IOTA, which is a few less. Okay. Anyone else? All right, so moving on. So I think the biggest, before talking about like the different, sure. So there's, there's no fees because every transact, like it was you know, like everyone is, in order to issue a transaction, yeah. Um, Since why is, so question so why is there fees in uh, Bitcoin for example? It's because they have miners, and then what the, what does the miners do? They do the validation. But in IOTA, like the user is also the validator. So if you're you, a user, you, you use the uh, you create the current transaction. You're also the validator of the uh, previous transactions, and then the future users would then validate your transactions. So like so, there's actually only one row here, 
and then because there's only one row, then um, there's there's no need to have like a fee structure anywhere here. But then, uh, so, so I asked you that the previous slide, uh, so I guess the reason you like this DAG be in the blockchain. Like for, for DAGs, it will require every user to be an algorithm. Is that necessarily um, a realistic expectation for all crypto currency users? That's actually what I'm going to get to, to right now, like the comparisons. And then sometimes, and then I think some of the use cases, I guess it also depends on some of the use cases that there might be, is it better for blockchains rather than DAX? But I'm getting, I'm getting too ahead of myself. So before, I, so before I talk about the differences, I'll first talk about the uh, CAP theorem, which is also called the Gruber, Gruber's theorem, which is created by Eric Gruber. He's a, uh, he's like a pioneer in uh, wireless networking He's also a professor, tenured professor at Berkeley. So his uh, his uh, theorem is a, about distributed data storage. Is that when you have a distributed data storage system with like read and write write capabilities, you can only have no more than two out of three of these CAP guarantees. And as you know, CAP is actually an acronym, which I'll get into right now. So who, who's familiar with CAP theorem? Okay. So, so for those who are not not as familiar, this these are the acronyms: consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So consistency is that um, if you have two distributed data storages and they have like they they have this like the same same data all the time. So that that means it is consistent. Available is that you have like different like distributed data storages and they can access each other and so forth. Or you have like the blockchain itself and you get, you have, you're able to access the blockchain to look up previous transactions. That that's what makes it accessible. So um, pub, public blockchains are like usually fully accessible. While permission blockchain are not like 100% uh, accessible depending on their uh, security characteristics. And then finally, the most interesting part is partition tolerance, which is whether if you have like two nodes, or like multi, you have like multiple nodes, and a few of the nodes goes down, whether the nodes remaining are still able to function. Like, or even like you have like four nodes and they all kind of split apart, whether all the nodes are able to function by themselves. And if they are, then that means that they are partition tolerance. For example, Let's say uh, TCP and UDP, those are two uh, internet protocols where TCP requires very like strict handshakes and so forth. Well, you do, and, then, and then because of that, um, whenever like a data packet is lost, then, then, it ha then there's a requirement for you to have to resend your data packet again. So some of the examples of TCP usage is like doing like very secure messaging between like, like server clients, for example, like, like payment systems. They require TCP because if you lose like parts of your data, that means you probably uh, lose lost part of your like your credit cards, like uh, information through this uh, trans like the secure transactions, and it, it's not will not be able to go through. So you have to like so the uh, so, so then you have this, the protocol means that you have to rebroadcast the data packets again. While UDP here mean, means that um, it it provides a lot of data packets and. Then, and then like individual data caps are not, not as important. So if they're dropped, they're dropped, and that's the problem. For example, UD, uh, UDP uh, like, uh, protocols include video streaming and also like playing video games. Because like if you like drop a few packets, um, like including like different like, pixels or like, different like some like features in a video game, um, it might be very, very tiny enough that like your eyes will not be able to see like See, see what's missing in the in the video game, for example. So like UDP here is more, uh, I would say, like more fault tolerant than compared to the TCP. It's more what? Uh, uh, fault to fault tolerant. Oh. Yeah. So uh, in relation in related to um, the databases that we have, relational databases, for example. Uh, Microsoft SQL, Oracle SQL, MySQL, they are they have to be completely consistent and uh, completely uh, like, and also accessible as well. Um, 
but at the expense of partition tolerance. While more of the uh, non-relational databases, for example, like CouchDB and Cassandra, like the NoSQLs, they have like um, availability and they, they're able to uh, partition, like have a uh, partition tolerance because of their document storage with the hopes that their, uh, like the storage will eventually become consistent with each other. Now, how does this relate to blockchain versus DAG? So blockchain, it is consistent all the time because it's, it's a global ledger and it's constantly forced because of this uh, blockchain. And then um, if there's a fork, then, then the miners will pick which one's the longer fork and then, and then the miners will converge to that fork so it's consistent. Both blockchain and DAX are also, uh, are also available because they need to they need to use the availability to look at a lot of private transactions to make sure that there's no uh, double spends. Uh, now let's take a look at uh, partition tolerance. Blockchain is not partition tolerance because if you have like nodes in the uh, if you have nodes in the uh, blockchain that are not up to speed, not consistent, not does not have the uh, latest blocks, then they'll end up just getting dropped out and then not be able to participate in the blockchain network which means that the blockchain would have like a lower hash rate and so forth. So DAX, meanwhile, um, it has a partition tolerance. For example, uh, in IOTA, for example, you can have DAX and then, and then you can uh, branch out to a bunch of like sub DAX that kind of branches off, branch off from the uh, main DAX and then the sub DAX with their all the like, local full nodes will keep that uh, DAX network and the transactions in place until eventually, for example, if it gets internet connections, then it will, at some time, reattach itself back to the uh, main DAG. So thus, it has a partition tolerance, but at the expense, the consistency will end up having to become eventual. For example, yeah. So does that mean the transactions are confirmed before the eventual happens? It's, so, um, so the trans so at least in IOTA's case, it will be uh, approved by like all the all the nodes within that uh, within that sub DAC, but it's not a uh, global but it's not a uh, global consensus where every single incoming uh, nodes will come in and then say that this your transactions is proven valid. Although like in terms of use cases. Um, it, it depends on different merchants. Like, if you have a very, very important transaction using uh, IOTA, and then you you put it into the uh, transaction, you like the sender and the receiver can like decide on saying that oh, we will not confirm this transaction until all the future incoming uh, transactions will either directly or indirectly confirm this um, this uh, transaction, which is if. 100% of incoming uh, transactions approved, like directly points to it, then your transaction has global consensus. But, but of course, it's always, it's always a question of when. While in the blockchain, you know, you know when, because it has, the, uh, it has like the uh, block intervals, as they said, every 10 minutes or so, that we will have a global consensus, so we have a fixed time, and if that does not happen, then they will adjust the difficulty rates accordingly to make it happen. Similar to like what happened with, uh, let's see, uh, with, with a spectrum, for example, like, let's say that you have two transactions. 
and then um, you put them both into the table. Eventually, um, like the future transaction will ultimately convert to pick on one of the transactions. And then it could like, and then they'll pick, pick one of the transactions, and then since when they do the tip selection, they will like, have to figure out whether it is a double spin or not. So initially, there might be some transactions that that would, that would, that would be both of them. But then soon, soon when these are two, 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 two transactions, incoming transaction will end up picking one of the one of the like, double spin and making this as the official one, while the other double spin will just end up becoming more official. What if the services are in your seat? What if, you know, what if, I forget what you're saying, but what if the products are in shift? Or, you know, confirm that it's false, but it's too late. And then that's up to the uh, that's up to the uh, like sender and merchant. So that's why they should, when you make a transaction, you should not immediately like get the confirmation. You need to confirm that like you need to say, oh, you need like X amount of transactions directly or indirectly um, confirm your transaction before like or validate your transaction before you say that your transaction is confirmed. For example, like in Going back to the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, you have the, the two forks right here. And then it's also kind of like the same idea in a blockchain, where they, the chain will just come longer and longer. And then um, and until if you, until like one of the chains overtake the other chain. And then usually, by the standard, if your, um, transa like your, like your, your transaction in a block, there's like five or six blocks in the future that points to it, then you know that it's, like, it's almost impossible for your block to be dropped because it's been, val it's been validated by all these like, blocks in the future. So like, also like in Bitcoin, they have this kind of rule that says that that's the way for multiple blocks, like five or six blocks, to confirm our block to make sure that in order to say that our transaction is So it's kind of the same rule here in uh, any other questions? Yeah. So, so the main question is whether there is a trade-off between having consistency or finality at a given point of time, at a set point of time, or whether you want to make it partition tolerant. Because if you want to make it partition tolerant, then you, then you need to be okay with part of your network to break it off and then have a different like data sets and then branch back into it again. And then um, and then if that and then if you're if you're and then if you're a partition caller, then you have to like, give up on some of the complete consistency that you that, that you see in uh, in uh, Bitcoin. So let's let's take a look at uh, let's take a, take a look at these comparisons in more of an industry sample. For example, you have finance, where you have a lot of uh, securities, trades, settlements going on. And then here, um, you're dealing with a lot of, like, like a lot of uh, financial transactions. Some of them really, really important. For example, you have clients that are moving millions of dollars around, and you want to get this finality set in place. So more often than not, it seems like blockchain here will be a better bet. And not just like public blockchain, but also like private permission blockchain as well, like for example Ripple. On the other hand, uh, you have IoT, a completely separate, uh, very, very different uh, industries where they just have like a mess of a mesh networks going around with a bunch of like, different IoT devices, and they have like, different uh, wireless protocols, and, and then usually it's like some, like this group of uh, IoT devices would have like less bandwidth or more bandwidth and so forth. Thus, it's very, very hard, but still, you still want to have some kind of a participation in some kind of a decentralized distributed protocol. But they won't be able to have this, uh, this finality, this consensus finality of a blockchain because blockchain is going to have 10 minutes intervals. And the uh, IoT devices, because of the lot of their latency and scattered limitations, you don't know like when will they will some of these devices will just come back on to the network or come back off. So here, 
we need to, in order for IOTs to participate in these ledgers, we need to have some kind of a partition tolerance and be okay with having these devices to maybe have a different like, consistency or having like, different, like, some have more up to date data than others at some temporary point of time. And then, so, what about other, other, other industries like healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, uh, supply chain? Social media, and even education. And I guess the answer is it all depends on like, how much you want, how much you like, uh, emphasize with doing the consistency, the finality, or whether you want just want to have like a uh, the more of a uh, uh, protocol that's that's a little bit less that's a little bit more flexible and lightweight, and. But then depending on what you need, then that will be your like, decisions to take on whether you want to have like, a DAG or a watch. So, so how are we doing with the time? It's 8.42. 8.42? So how long? That's like an hour? Uh, you've been on for an hour, yeah. For an hour, okay. So, uh, so, so yeah, this is a lot of uh, information, so I'll go over this really quick. So, the first one is whether DLT is whether it's one size fits all, and the answer is it's very very hard to say this because we have, like we have a lot of different use cases, different applications we've seen in uh, like finance and IoT, like how different these spaces are, and it's all like difficult for you to have like a uh, for you like to have like a distributed ledger, like for like for everything. The second takeaway is that from our example. There might be actually have multiple ways to like, resolve the double spin problem more than what we see in uh, Bitcoin. For example, like we have, uh, for example, we have um, like FICO that, that uses more of like a user of uh, like the validation method to, to resolve the double spins. But once again, only time and production will tell, which is why uh, Bitcoin is still going so strong, even though people always criticize the technology all the time, but they have been going through a lot, a lot of the uh, different like they, they've been through a lot of like, different uh, trials and errors and to get to where they are right now just by living for like nine years. It's just, it's, it's like recently they're not person. And then another question is whether you want to parallelize or uh, synchronize the, uh, the transactions. So in order, to, in order for you to, so that has these ability to make do do all these transactions in parallel, but at the expense of synchronize, we're making this more of this global consistency. While blockchain is able to like synchronize the blockchain, for example, and then to have like, this order of transactions, but at the expense of being able to have more scalability that you can do through like parallel or processing. So the fourth one is never forget the uh, physical layers because even though know, like your uh, Protocol, your blockchain, your DLT may look really like in the paper. It always has to be tested on the real world. And here, these uh, computing experts on some microsystem, they have described all these fallacies about distributed computing, where in the real real world, the network is not always reliable, the, the latency is not always zero, and the bandwidth is not always infinite. So when you want to create your uh, DLT, you need to create one that is able to be able to accommodate all these and able to be resilient with all these, uh, these uh, potential issues. And then last but not least one is that when you're looking at a, like a technology you could potentially invest in, um, or just like at least to turn it up, don't just look at the technology but also the organizations around it. For example, uh, IOTA is a nonprofit foundation and then um, Radius is actually a private uh, LTD, like a limited company. So because of their organization, they might have like, different like, suits and different, like, different interests. And that might also change like how they uh, pursue their partners, as well as their like, protocol offerings. So, um, so thanks for uh, sticking around. I know it's like a long presentation. But um, if you have any other uh, final questions, uh, definitely uh, let me know. So, Right, you said it was 
So it's it's a company, but the uh, that's a good question. Um, I I don't think it's commercial, but you know. Right? Thanks so much for coming, guys.